An excerpt from Artifacts Across the Ages, a catalog for Quest and Commerce, by Lili Frugfessa. The legend of the Ring of Gax, reportedly conferred via divination by the now notorious Rary of Ket, is as follows. 936 years before the advent of the common year, there was a meteor shower of particularly vivid intensity. This much is confirmed by both Siloese and Arcosian sources. Reportedly, one of these meteors landed in a small scrap of farmland in the far western land of Myrrh. In the process of hauling the meteorite from its crater, the thing cracked open, revealing a strange ring inside. That ring is now forever connected to the name of this young man who discovered it, Gax. In less than a decade, Gax had conquered the whole of Myrrh, and was sending his armies far enough afield to worry lands as great and distant as the old Baclinish Empire and the Celestial Imperium of Shao Feng. But just as quickly as Gax's fortunes rose, they fell, in a pattern that would become familiar for those who came to possess the ring in subsequent centuries. For Hamid al-Jabbar, Chaldin the Unscrupulous, and Eodrich of Merle, the story was quite the same. Great power and prestige, won by magic and often by blood, abruptly lost, usually with the wearer coming to a bad end. The Ring of Gax appears as a ring of burnished gold, set with the open-mouthed heads of three creatures at equal spacing around the circumference of the ring. One goat, one dragon, and one lion. The exterior of the ring is an ornate housing, which only partially covers an incredibly complex internal mechanism, so that tiny gears may be seen turning within, along with three colored wheels of cut crystal or gemstone, which run in parallel within the ring's circumference. On a schedule similar to, but not quite the same as a day's length, these translucent wheels rotate, and this seems somehow to determine the ring's potent but otherwise randomized effects. All of its most famous wielders have been sorcerers or magi of some sort, though in some or all cases their arcane power may have come from the ring itself. At some point, due perhaps to an unhappy alignment in the ring's three color wheels, the ring of Gax always disappears, only to reappear years and sometimes centuries later in some other location. No known owner of the ring has ever solved this problem, although there have long been rumors of a means to summon the ring through the use of a separate and equally mysterious object. For reference, see Zagging Wygrain's Allotrope Amulet, a.k.a. the Diamond Locket of Harvey. In the city of Greyhawk, five individuals are united by circumstance. A brewer-priest a haunted swordsman, a living relic, a caustic criminal, and a golem without a past. With the drawing of a single card, their lives have been turned upside down. Welcome to the Chimera, a role-playing adventure podcast. Our campaign this season is called Misplaced. It takes place in the venerable setting of Greyhawk, kind of, and we're playing with a modified version of 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. I'm Vin LeBate, and I play Golden Eyed Rakashi, a dragonborn rogue, Joining me today are... I'm Braden Lamb, and I'm playing Balmo, a halfling cleric. I'm Jeffrey Bard, and I play Sir Simeon, the human sword mage. I'm Josh Hallbachner, and I play Ashwar, a warforged sorcerer. I'm Casey Smith, and I play Latchkey, a shardmine with the dual classes of Battlemind and Scion. And I'm Kelly Weissman Aspruth Jackson, the dungeon master. Now, let's get started. All right, so for tonight's episode, we're trying something a little bit different. This is a Rakashi-centered episode, since this is currently uh, during the party split, and most of the characters are off inside the cube, and Rakashi is not. Um, Last time, we had an extended flashback that covered, I think, some important backstory information and established a couple of things, and noted a connection to not a connection but it it showed us the first interaction between Rikashi and Darbin Tolric um and I think it was the first appearance of Darbin Tolric although this was one of that was one of the characters that Braden established early on as part of the backstory for Bolmo um tonight what I want to do is to have a series of smaller flashback scenes that well, one of my goals is that they'll establish a larger, longer standing relationship between Rikashi and Darvin Tolric, since he's just shown up in the present in Rikashi's storyline. 
But the way we're going to do that is by playing a little bit of an improv game together. So tonight we have... Scenes from a hat. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not that game, but yeah, this is something along that. I've, I've been thinking in my head a little bit about, you know that one they play on Whose Line Is Any Is Any Way Where You... One person has to be standing, one has, person has to be sitting, one person has to be lying down. Mm-hmm. I think there's going to be That's some problems with that. <laughs> in an audio format. Not in the literal I'm sense. I'm strapped to a I've computer right about. now. <laughs> do, you, do you belt yourself in? Is that part of your audio conservation strategy then? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so here's the way this is going to work. We're going to have six scenes tonight. And each of them is going to have, at least in, in at some point, it will have all three of Darbin, Rikashi, and Balmo. And in each scene, we'll start out with the scene being between two people. And then the third one will enter at some point. And it's okay if one of if one or even both of the other characters leaves, in fact, but there'll be some sort of a transition moment where the third person enters the scene and, and what the scene is about changes for that reason. We're going to do six scenes because there are six possible combinations under the following rules. Each scene will be established and to some degree controlled by one of the three players. Here I'm counting myself as a player for this purpose. Um, so that person will be in charge of establishing what is the scene, like what what's happening, what, where where are we, what's going on, and establishing for the the other person that they're initially with, the other character they're initially with, what is that character doing, why are they there, and so they'll sort of be in charge of the scene. I'll still be acting as the GM in terms of things like if we have other NPCs, we need to account for. If there are questions about canonicity or timeline or stuff, I'll step in to do that, but the person who's sort of running things will be in charge of like, what's what's going on here, right? If you're saying, okay, and then there was a festival in the city of Greyhawk. Like, okay, you're in charge of what's the festival about? What's going on here? Um, tell us the details. That's all going to come from you if you're in charge of that scene. So one person's in charge. They've got one other character there with them, and they're in charge of, of telling them why they're there, you know, establishing what, what their connection is to the scene. But then there's a third person. That third person is going to enter totally when they choose to, when they think it's the right moment for their character to enter for, for whatever reason. And they're going to then uh, have some ability to disrupt the scene because they're going to make their entrance when they want to make their entrance. And and that's going to be under their own sense of... They're not going to have to wait for the person who's in charge to tell them, okay, now you can come in. Um, so that's there's six possible combinations there, right? There's basically... Uh, I'll tell you the order here. Darbin is in... Uh, a Darbin scene where it's Darbin and Rikashi and then Balmo enters. A Balmo scene where it's Balmo and Darbin and then Rikashi enters. A Rikashi scene where it's Rikashi and Balmo and then Darbin enters. A Balmo scene where it's Rik- Balmo and Rikashi and then Darbin enters. A Rikashi scene where it's Rikashi and Darbin and then Balmo enters. And then a Darbin scene where it's Darbin and Balmo and then Rikashi enters. That's the order of events you don't need to memorize it all okay, that's you good you go along <laughs> yes um so that's the structure six scenes and then to add a little bit of flavor to things uh we're each going to give the other two characters uh well the other two players some thing for their character that they're going to need to include at some point in these six scenes tonight and that it's my impetus for this is that it's going to be similar to the way we were doing um, XP goals during the old bones mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the slight twist on it is that the, the thing has to be in the context of a memory. So for instance, I'll just give you the ones that I have. I already worked this out for your characters. So Brayden, my challenge for Balmo tonight mm-hmm is that one in one of these scenes has to establish for Balmo that time that he got way too drunk. Right, so that one of these scenes tonight will be for Balmo, oh, right, that was that time that I got too drunk 
mm-hmm. and it was a problem or you know whatever the memory is and then for rakashi then uh one of the scenes tonight will at least in part be that time when rakashi was really legitimately happy not like not currently perturbed or uh not in the middle of a problem but actually legitimately happy and probably not schadenfreude either <laughs> <laughs> that's up to vin uh vin's yeah. in charge of what makes rakashi happen, happen. yeah so uh, I'm, I'm i don't i don't need it to be uh wholesome uh, I just needed to actually be happiness. So, does that make sense? Does, do you have the general sense of what I have in mind here? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So, Braden, do you have any uh, thoughts about little sort of uh, memory goals you can give to Darwin or Rakashi? Ah, okay. Um, for, uh, let's see, for Rakashi, maybe... Uh... Balmo places trust in you and is pleasantly surprised when that trust is uh, (laughs) well-placed. And for Darwin, uh, let's see, maybe successfully passing successfully passing some disgusting food item off as something more palatable (laughs) all right pawning off pawning off disgusting food cool then what do you got for us um i'm gonna say belmo should show a moment where he has some conflict or tension with his order Mm -hmm. and Darbin will have to improvise some sort of cooking setup or ingredients. Great. So, our first scene is a dinner party at the house, the estate of a member of the Greyhawk City Council. Mm. Actually, it's going to be the home of the chief judge of Greyhawk, Sir Anton Palmerian. And Rakashi is at this party because she is charged with stealing a locket from a noble woman named oh you know what charge of stealing a locket from the despotrix of hardby this is one that's a smaller city state that is closely associated with greyhawk and at times has been controlled directly by greyhawk but has a a, a gynarchy it has a, a hereditary Despotrix, mm. right? The feminine version of, of despot. Mm. There was a period where Zagig, when he was mayor of Greyhawk, was also the despot, uh, the one and only despot of Hardby. Mm. Um, so, yes, steal the locket from the despotis, despotrix of Hardby uh, at the party being thrown again by Sir Anton Palmyrian the chief judge of the city of Greyhawk. So it's a lovely party. Very upper crust affair. Lots of fancy dress, gowns, uh, chamber music. There is some waltzing going on. They're only serving wine with bubbles in it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Generally, it's an elite affair. And... Rikashi is there, uh, and so is Darwin, because Darwin is the guest chef of the evening. He is presiding over the carving station at the moment, several different types of, uh, of roast beast. There's dire boar um, and a variety of other uh, delicacies. Um, yeah. 
What would you like to do, Rikashi? So, Rikashi is wearing the face of a local uh, aristocrat. She's the daughter of uh, of one of the city councilors who isn't present. Mm-hmm. He's actually away at a conference in a neighboring uh, a neighboring region. Um, and in fact, the whole family is, but she's passing herself off as being the representative of them here. Mm-hmm. But also as being sort of young and not really up on the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, her name is, let's say, Corinne. Mm-hmm. Um, and what she's doing is talking to the Despotrix and just fawning over <laughs> over uh, the whole the concert of the gynarchy uh, over uh, a lot of the decisions that she's made in the last few years essentially like fangirling mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah that's her situation at the moment alright so so she's uh, fangirling over the despotics despotics of Harvey uh, despotics is a tall red haired woman very imperious in her bearing. This is appropriate. And while she wouldn't, I think it would be overly generous to say that she's eating it up because that's not the sort of thing that she would show in her expression. Uh, She is certainly tolerating a lot of it in a way that she doesn't give a lot of time to people who are uh, not, you know, on the same political rung as her. So it's that it's her willingness to stand and continue to listen uh, to Corinne suggests that she is enjoying the attention. Corinne also occasionally will drop hints of um, a desire for more political connection, mm-hmm. um, a sharing of power, or um, she doesn't have a lot of confidence that her father would necessarily go along she might be able to convince him she might not but um she may also be considering leaving home in one capacity or another very good the uh the despotrix listens with attention and uh makes a few very flexible comments saying oh you know that we're always interested in welcoming new citizens to the city of Harby, those that appreciate our way of life and see the value in it. Um, so mildly encouraging, but not quite committal. While this conversation is happening, Darbin is working the room with a platter. He has chunks of some sort of tartare uh, laid out on it and eventually works his way over to where Corinne and the Despotrix are speaking and offers the morsels to them, saying with great pomp and fanfare, I slew this this morning, fresh for this feast tonight. I hope that you will enjoy what I've prepared for you. The, um, the Despotrix lightly takes one of the smaller pieces and samples it, considers it, nods very mildly in approval. The Lady Corinne follows suit. Mm -hmm. She's clearly taking her cues. Okay, sort of mirroring her behavior. Mm -hmm. All right. Darbin moves on. Jump me forward to Rikashi's next step in the plan. Uh, well, as she's going on, she'll wave over uh, one of the wait staff who's carrying around a tray of champagne. Mm-hmm. My lady, have you tried the champagne yet? It's um, there's there's not a lot that I can say about the Duke of the Western Province here, aside from the fact that he produces very fine grapes. The proper mode of address is your eminence. Young one, but... Apologies. I will take your recommendation under advisement. She accepts one of the flutes and sips it. Smiles very slightly. Seems satisfied. That will happen four or five more times over the course of the night. 
uh, always accompanied by little sort of political factoids about the origin of the various drinks that are being passed around. And then at one point, she'll say, I, I don't, my father's been talking about certain arrangements uh, and treaties that might, might have a little interest for you. Um, there's a lot of people in this room. Would you like to go upstairs? Shh. The Despotrix is not the sort of person who's going to show their liquor. Mm-hmm. But she's had a lot to drink and is a little bit uneasy on her feet. And so Rikashi can tell is co- she's compensating. Right? She's being... She's speaking even more slowly than she had been earlier in the night. She's moving even less because she's aware of not wanting to appear as drunk as she knows that she is. She nods in agreement and starts to move with Corinne towards the staircase as Corinne is sort of allowing her by because in the etiquette is such that the despotrix ought to go before her, she feels a hand on her shoulder. She turns around, but only just with her head. Mm -hmm. It's Darwin. Master Tolric? Lady Corinne, there is a problem in the kitchens that I'm afraid I'm going to need to ask your help with. There's a pause. It's a long pause. She sort of Looks him over. Of course, Master Tolric. Um, my lady, I'll... I'm sorry, your eminence. I'm so indoctrinated into the systems here. It's maddening. Um, I will meet you upstairs. Would you mind terribly keeping an eye on my drink? The... Despotrix looks a little bit askew at the idea of, frankly, doing anything for someone uh, below her social rank, but she's enjoyed Corinne's company and eventually accepts the uh, the beverage to monitor. Thank you. Your grace is, is boundless. She bows slightly, and as she does, she slips a little powder into her drink mm-hmm. and then hands it over. I... I'm certain this won't take long, but, you know, very often none of these people can do things on their own. You know how it is. Uh, Darwin leads you back into the kitchen and actually through another door into a pantry, which is entirely empty. And uh, once he's closed the door, says, so are we going to talk about what you're here to steal or is it to kill? Either way, I'm going to make sure it's not your problem. If someone dies at one of the parties that I'm the head chef for, you realize that the first thing they're going to look at is were they poisoned, and then they're going to want to talk to me. Oh, oh, I don't worry. I'm not here for any of that kind of mess. This is this is quick and quiet, and maybe a little bit disruptive, but not 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 in a not in that kind of sense. Not in not in a culinary sense. All right, Uh, it's Rikashi, right? He seems to be just confirming your name, not in the sense of not knowing your identity, but just making sure that he's remembering correctly. Why do you know that? Well, remind me, Vin, did you establish the name of Corinne's father? Uh, no. Okay. Councilman Holbrun and his whole family left town Two days ago, I know this because I accompanied them part of the way on the road out of town, and they told me where they were going. Corinne was in the wagon with the rest of them. So I know you're not Corinne, and I know that you must be pretty confident the name was Rikashi, because we met once before at one of Nenshin's lock-ins a year or so ago and one of 
the gifts that I happen to possess is the true sight. She, her affect changes when he mentions that. Mm -hmm. Um, It's definitely much less playful now. Mm -hmm. Well, Master Tolric, I have a great respect for your abilities, both culinary and otherwise. I have work to do. I will stay out of your way. You will stay out of mine. Because, frankly, we can both cause each other a lot of trouble and we don't need it. Have a good night. Also, everything you've prepared is wonderful. And she walks out of the room. He uh, sort of bows politely as she passes. Seems satisfied with that. I assume, Vin, that uh, Rikashi's next step is to go upstairs to uh, try and see the Despotrix again? Yes. Okay. Uh, what did Rikashi put in the drink, by the way? Um, Just a little knockout powder. Mm-hmm. Not, not fast acting, something that'll take a few minutes to kick in. So when uh, when Rikashi gets upstairs, the Despotrix has... Oh, actually, uh, mm-hmm. if I can jump in here. Uh, as, <laughs> as you head back out uh, to the floor where everybody's mingling, the Despotrix of Hardby has been cornered by Balmo in his... Uh, oh, Cuthbert's balls. <laughs> who is kind of... In, in a friendly but intense way interrogating her about her knowledge of uh what's what's the what's the study of wines there's there, i'm sure there's some kind of word for oh, it. oh yeah um, oh. uh it's probably some oh. derivative of vino right i feel like it's something weirder i think it starts with okay. an o anyway Bal- Bal- mm. balmo doesn't know it the desperate tricks <laughs> i'm sure it does does yes he's <laughs> uh debating the the merits of uh, uh, of and and differences of uh, wines and beers, and and is in the middle of telling her the, this hilarious story about how they make, you know, fizzy, sweet, slightly sour beers that a lot of people call kids' beer, um, which is uh, probably not going to go over very well. It's onology, O E N O L O G Y. Ah, I thought so. The Desperate Drakes looks much less interested in this uh, subject area, but partially because Balmo does have a lot of force of personality behind him, partially from positioning in the room, and partially because her social maneuverability is lessened by her current level of intoxication, she's a little bit stuck. Mm -hmm. And so hasn't managed to extricate herself yet from the conversation. Ah, your eminence. I see that you have... Found one of our local clerics, Brother Balmo, formerly Brother ba- formerly Balmo Barley Wayne. I think he actually does stumble there. <laughs> uh, now of the Order of Saint Wenta, I'm I'm here accompanying uh, Mother Wharton. Where did she go? Uh, Rikashi slightly bumps Balmo in a way that. Uh, hopefully is invis- invisible to the Despotrix, but uh, causes him to jostle her arm, uh, spilling the drink that was originally hers. Whoa. Watch it. Oh, you... Look at what you've done. Do you... Do you understand? Of course you don't. I'm sorry, Your Eminence. Let's... Let's go finish our conversation elsewhere. Uh, you the... can have that drink. This one? Not you. <laughs> it looks like there's still a little bit left in there. It's fine. I'll, I'll just... I, I've been meaning to taste some of this, and I think it's almost gone, so I better... Mm. Yeah. He's, he's mm. reaching for it. How dare you? <laughs> do you... Oh. Do you even understand the station of the woman you're speaking to? That's what I thought. <laughs> oh, I believe I see uh, Mother Weston over there in the far corner. Off you go. Turn, push. <laughs> uh, Bal- Balmo goes off to, to sample some more of the uh, some more of this inferior uh, champagne bubbly wine. This is is now 
having trouble even hiding her level of intoxication. It's definitely the the alcohol has caught up with her a bit, but she seems appreciative of Corinne's assistance in getting out of what was a rather dull conversation to her. And now is being led upstairs, yes? Yes. Okay. Meanwhile, Darbin comes over to Balmo and offers him a glass of champagne, having seen his friend was here, and says, are you having a good time, Brother Balmo? Uh, not as good as I'd like. This, this piss is just not doing it for me. <laughs> the choices are always few and poor at these things. Society's better half doesn't know how to drink properly. Amen. <laughs> he, uh, Darwin looks out wistfully, sort of, sort of, just sort of surveying the crowd, standing next to Balmo, and watches Rikashi as Corinne lead uh, the desperate up the stairs and says, just sort of says quietly, not necessarily to Balmo, but within, loud enough for him to hear, says, what an impressive woman. Which one? I have trouble distinguishing between faces when they're above a certain height. <laughs> yes, I suppose we're all just weeds to you. Pass him on the shoulder, friendly gesture. Uh, and Rikashi is successful in obtaining the locket, we will say. Yeah, um, she, once once the, uh, the Despotrix is uh, essentially out cold, Mm-hmm. She'll carefully slip off the locket and just exit out a window. Very good. The locket is uh, just for point of reference is pretty odd because it's it's rather it's rather large. It's probably a good three inches by two two and a half inches. It's sort of a not quite a rectangle. It's like a uh, octagon with small small corners and long or small. It, it's a rectangle with the, the corners cut off, right? So it's like a. It's eight sided, but not equal sides. Yeah, um, it's got a stone in it. Uh, it does not have a stone in it. I mean, it's hmm. not. It's pretty. It, it's made of some kind of, um, oh, probably some kind of crystal or, or ah. very fancy cut glass. Hmm. It has a, what appears to be a golden framework around the edging of it. Um, if you open it, it's not holding anything. It has a a large kind of circular indentation in it, almost like it was a, a case for some sort of very fancy ring, but there's no ring inside. Hmm. Oh, into the bag it goes. There you go. All right, that's the end of our first scene. The next scene is Balmo and Darbin. Balmo, uh, so Brayden, you're in charge of this scene, setting where we are and why uh, Balmo and Darbin are there. And... Then Rikashi will enter when you decide that it's right for her to enter. Okay. Let's say we're in a in a catacomb complex mm-hmm. somewhere out of town looking for rare fungi. This uh this complex hasn't been used in in a while at least not by the living uh, and uh, Darwin has probably brought Balmo along uh, as uh, as a bit of uh, insurance against those uh, current tenants. There's uh, an area not that far from Greyhawk called the Star Carns, which is uh, a, a popular adventuring site. It's an a, 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 an old burial, sort of like it's like a minor version of the. Um, Valley of the Kings, you know, it's just an area where there were mm. a lot of different important crypts with interesting things in them. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a potential, might be a good match to what the area you're describing is. Mm. So Darbin is uh, got his bag in hand and he's got a torch in the other and, and hunting around looking for uh, interesting looking mushrooms that he might be able to cook and prepare. It's the meat that always gets their attention, Balmo, you understand. There's got to be an impressive 
meat or no one cares what you're cooking. But in practice, I find that it's the quality of the sauce or the complementary side dishes that actually make the meal memorable. Hmm. Uh, and so in this case, you're considering the meat, the, uh, the, the fungus. Well, if I can find enough of the more noteworthy sorts, uh, that'll be the goal for tonight. But if I can't, then I'll have to improvise and find something maybe a little bit more traditional to take the center role and then use the fungus as the flavor accompaniment. Mm -hmm. It's all a matter of what the hunt produces, you understand. I try not to go into these things with an open mind, stay flexible. You never know what the course of events will throw at you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited to see the last crown that these kings wear. <laughs> now, would you recommend uh, something with a lot of hops in order to cut through the funk of, uh, of one of these? That sounds promising. I think a sour would go well with some of the more buttery sorts of mushrooms. Hmm. I don't hold much for sours myself, but, uh, but I know those who do. Tolric! Darbin, his ears visibly perk up at the sound of his name. He looks around. Approaching them, uh, walking on the ceiling. Hmm. <laughs> is Rikashi. Mm -hmm. Here you are. Why Why are you, Why do I have to come here to find you? Uh, Balmo is uh, pointing his decorative beer stein furiously in your direction and wielding a, a, a tap handle. Not Probably not the tap handle. Uh, this is uh, just, a, just one that he's uh, taken a liking to. Mm. Oh, settle down, Barley Wayne. I'm just here because I fucked up one of Nenshin's tablecloths, and I got shit duty. And shit duty is trucking out here through the fucking woods into a whatever the fuck this is to deliver some message to Master Tolric. And she hands him a scroll. Balmo turns to, to Darwin and says, you know this lizard? I'm well I mean, I, I know her. <laughs> I'm well acquainted with... Uh... Onyx Rakashi by now. We're old friends. Uh, it's only Onyx to the cops. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm I'm well acquainted with her, too. He gives, gives Rakashi <laughs> the stink eye. He takes out the scroll and reads it. Do you have it? Vin, do you have an intention with the scroll? It's just a, a request for services, essentially. Mm-hmm. 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 All right, he, he reads it, looks thoughtful, puts it away. Says, Thank you very much, Rikashi, for delivering this message. You may tell your employer that I will be only too happy to assist with his dinner party. And I am free, I believe, on that date, so. Great. Good news for him and good news for me. Would you like to stay and help us hunt for mushrooms? We found some very choice morsels already that depends do you know how to get out of here why yes i've come here several times before and so it wouldn't be hard at all for me to show you the way out great she drops down off the ceiling mushroom time wonderful darvin not in a overbearing or mm, tiresome way, starts offering the occasional bit of information about, well, see, look at this, this mushroom. This is good for a sauce, but you need to boil it off a bit and preserve the fluid. The flesh itself is has a texture that isn't pleasing. So it, that's sort of like, Anecdotes about this thing, that thing. Rakashi immediately eats that mushroom. Or you can just eat it 
raw and unprepared without <laughs> any sort of artistry or care in presentation. No, this is sure. good. It's really pungent. <laughs> oh yeah, you're uh what is it? Half swamp dragon or something? If you want to put it in the most offensive way possible, sure. I mean, I suppose you're just half, so. <laughs> Holy shit. Do you want a mushroom? I would like a mushroom. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Darbin continues to his continues in his hunt for mushrooms and continues to share facts that he finds interesting. Bulma uh, also finds them interesting. Uh, he's uh, it's it, it occurs to him at one point that um, uh, that beer involves uh, some some fungus for the uh, for the uh, fermentation mm-hmm. uh, and uh, starts uh, grilling Darbin about uh, mushroom men. <laughs> he's like if. If there are sentient mushrooms, they must make a really potent beer, I would assume. Well, the thing about the myconids is that they don't eat like you and I do. I was very disappointed when I first encountered them many years ago. They have no appreciation for the culinary arts. They just subsist on what you or I might consider to be table scraps. So... I wouldn't be surprised if some enterprising Myconid colony here or there that was close enough to some outpost of civilization decided that it could make a good living by making beer for others to eat. Oh, no, no, no. I think you misunderstand me. I meant make them into beer. Hmm. Intriguing thought. You know, I'm going to take a second to apologize I like you more than I thought I did. (laughs) Why? What brought this about? Is it the uh, suggestion of murder? It it was sort of the combination of murder and beer. Oh, well. And and the willingness to take a different angle on things. Master Tolric, as much as I love his work, has expressed a couple of times over the course of the evening uh, a very set view on taste. Not everyone tastes things the same way. Maybe he could pay a little attention to how other people look at things. Hmm. Darbin, um, Darbin's face is a little hard to read there, but he definitely takes it in. Well, Rikashi, though I have trained in five different cities with ten different chefs, Spent decades honing my skills. I will warrant that I still may have a few things to learn about the complexities in the way that tastes do vary from person to person. She smiles. I want to be clear. I'm in no way questioning your skill or your education. I'm just saying there are... There are people and things out there other than chefs in the highest schools. Hmm. Hmm. Almo stands up. This uh, seems a little bit personal. How about I go and uh, summon us up a little bit of a uh, little bit of ale? Yes, that sounds great. That does sound great. Almo, do, do that. I, I like the sound of that. So tell me more about this Tell me more about what informs your palate, Rikashi. I'd like to get a sense of what what does a woman like yourself have a taste for? Well, though it was put in elegantly, I do have a touch of the swamp dragon in me. Mm-hmm. And there's a sort of a natural predilection towards things that are pungent, rotten, foul, acidic. And I know I know you can work with that palate. I've seen I've seen your work. Mm-hmm. But there's there's a certain sometimes you find something 
unprepared and it's it's as it needs to be or sometimes it needs to be buried in the ground for six months and then dug up and then it's fine Durbin Durbin laughs and nods emphatically says, yes yes now that I can appreciate I can appreciate you know, I once saw a man catch a fish he pulled it right out of the narrative and he didn't gut it. He just put it into a jar he'd prepared of salt and buried it. And then six months later, we came back, dug it up, had it with toast. It was magnificent. Yes, that does sound good. I'm going to try that. i get back to town, which we should do because I hate it here. You are definitely a, a city person, Rakashi, I can tell. Balma has uh, finished his incantation and comes back with a sloshing tankard full of ale. Uh, well, my friend and Rakashi, here's to lying, cheating, stealing, and drinking. If you're going to lie, lie for a friend. If you're going to cheat, cheat death. If you're going to steal, steal a heart. If you're going to drink, drink with me. She happily takes the tankard and uh, takes a very long draft out of it. Gentlemen, I think we have come to an understanding. And she gives them both a hug. Who's buried here now? I think that's a good place to end the scene. Scene three is Rikashi and Balmo, with Rikashi doing our narration. So where do you want to set yourself in Balmo there, Ben? We are in the basement of the Western Wind. It is some years later, um, after prison, when Rikashi has come to to dwell in, in a room down here. There's a party of some sort going on upstairs. Um that she would really prefer to be at. But right now she is standing with Balmo in front of a large hole in the wall. So I really have no desire to deal with this or anything, but I feel like I probably shouldn't ignore the fact that I was going to go upstairs, but there's a big hole in the wall and there's some noises down there. And this hole wasn't here yesterday. Um, yeah, so there's a hole in your building. What kind of hole? It's it's How like big? it's like three and a half feet tall and about as wide. It sort of just looks like it looks like there was a space behind it that the wall sort of collapsed into. It's hard to say whether something had been at least it's hard for Akashi to say whether something had been excavating it or whether it was just some sort of geological happenstance. But it definitely goes back a ways. And it doesn't sound from your description like that's uh, Brother Durin looking to expand the cellar again. No, I'm used to that. That's much louder. All right. I'll bite. Let's go take a look at this mysterious thing in the dark. I volunteered myself, didn't I? All right. Let me get a torch. I get a torch and we head into this hole. Um, I can probably grab a lantern from upstairs. Oh. I don't expect it'll be gone that long. That sounds like a better idea. I grab a lantern instead. Um, so we head into the hole. It's it's sort of a tight fit in the beginning, but it opens out. It's dark. It smells bad. How much, uh, how much can you... Can Rakashi change her appearance? Can she become like the size of a halfling? Uh, no, she's limited to medium-sized creatures. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think Balmo probably suggests that that he's not he's not too uh, not too cramped in here, and uh, maybe you should uh, try being a halfling. That's not quite in my bag of tricks, but don't worry about me. I have to fit through smaller, stupider places than this. So, like, does this place have rats or something? 
Not if I can help it. Yeah, old uh, Mashy here. He holds up his uh, his still not not the uh, not the relic tap handle, but the the one that he's uh, taken a shine to. I'll, I'll say it's it's a Barley Wayne Brewery tap handle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, we run a tight ship, which is interesting because I've never been on a ship. <laughs> Me neither. I understand they're tight. Yeah, I think I'm going to continue avoiding them for the foreseeable. I like to be able to see land at least. Yeah, I like to be under land if possible. Yeah, that's not bad. Just to make extra sure that there is land around. I don't have to just look down. I can look in any direction. Yeah, like this cave that we are in. Now I know in... I know it's very fashionable nowadays to build above ground and halflings have uh, started doing that. There's there's a whole city center in Dunhill that's, uh, you know, a couple stories high. I don't know why they do it, but our brewery is all is all subterranean. Hmm. Does that does that have an effect on the flavor? Do you think? Uh, in fact, the opposite. It uh keeps everything cool so that uh no unusual flavors uh will will arise Hmm. she nods i haven't been back there in a while things are a little strained with some of my family she nods family Mm -hmm. you should he's he's about to say something and then then regards rikashi you should visit i'll let you know next time my sister Kayla's in town. She'll, she can uh, take you on a tour. I am legitimately torn between my desire to see your brewery and all of the beer that is there and my absolute hatred of leaving the city. I'm going to have to make a pro-con list. So, so, yeah. Let's, uh, let's see if we can't figure out what's been, what's been making this whole. It sure goes back a ways. It sure does. Does, do these... Do these scrapes look like they're fresh? Do they look like they're old? She's sort of holding up a lantern and gazing at what she thinks are like dig marks on the wall. Hmm. Balmo's not great at dungeoneering. He's not trained in it. Yeah, Rakashi isn't particularly great in it either. Do you... Do you hear that? Hmm. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the other side of the coin to yes and nope mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> sorry it's these these mutton chops have gotten a little too luxurious <laughs> oh, you people in your hair um, they reach a point where there's a sort of large hole in the floor that drops down mm-hmm. and there's definitely the sound of water and motion Hmm. What kind of things live in a pit? Uh, demons. I don't think we're that far down. <laughs> Here, let me let me see the lantern. She takes the lantern, ties a piece of rope to it, sort of lowers it down, revealing a large, looks like possibly a natural space that's been eroded away. Um. And then something large and insectish, with a lot of legs, sort of zips by the light and makes a weird noise. Uh, that's a. Is that a carrion crawler? Not for long. Almo hefts mashy and uh, starts trotting off in the direction that it went. Oh, that wasn't the response I wanted. She follows carefully like checking her checking her back a lot you don't think this is a bad idea uh look i've i've got uh approximately three jobs one of them is to ensure the safety of the sellers and if something is getting in i'm gonna at least make sure that it can't get very far gotcha she pulls out her swords which she had stopped to pick up on the way down uh, as they head in a little farther, the space gets about, you know, knee deep in water, 
or hip deep for some people. Um, and they enter a sort of chamber at the end of it where the water pools and around the edge of the pool are a lot of mm, football sized eggs and a very angry carrying crawler. And okay, go mash it. Uh, all right. Okay. It's uh, it's a little bigger than I, than I thought it would be. Um, Let's let's go with uh, may our coffins be made from a hundred year teak and may that tree be planted on Monday next week. And he takes a swing at it and uh, and uh, Balmo and Rakashi get a get a bonus to AC sixteen plus seven so uh, thirty thirty no twenty three twenty twenty three is good enough to hit so remember what we're maximizing damage on everything mm-hmm. oh, yeah. in the interest of speedier combat. So uh, your total damage currently with that would be again, just what, what's currently on your character sheet. Don't worry right. about trying to go back and figure out what you would or wouldn't mm-hmm. have. But. So that is a uh, 15 damage. Okay. Very good. The carrion crawler is, you know, thwacked badly by that and uh, reels and makes a high pitched uh, squealy kind of noise. <laughs> and attempts to bite you with its tentacles. Face tentacles. Uh, Bomo's armor class? Uh, 19, but it's now 20. Oh, that reminds me. He's small, so I have to roll twice. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Uh, the creature misses. Attempts to bite and... Uh, Goes a little wide and almost able to dodge out of the way. Rikashi? Uh, Rikashi, as it's going for Balmo, dips around behind it and just jams some swords in its back. Okay. Uh, you gave me a bl- little bit of blocking there, so it's good enough for a level one stunt. Oh, all right. So that's a 28. It's a hit. Uh, and damage is, uh, 14 plus 12, 26. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just take the extra chunk of damage, I suppose. Since I don't have the chart up. Okay, that's another, it's another, basically, what's the base damage of your weapon? No, D8. 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 So it's another eight. Nice. Um, Okay. Um, it's a bad stab for the creature and its limbs flail a bit. Reminder, this, so a carrion crawler has qualities of both an insect and a cephalopod. So there's both tentacles and chitin and claws and pincers and teeth. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're pretty nasty and grody. Mm. Um, Oh, are, okay, are they uh, aberration? Yeah. Oh, well then, uh, extra six damage to it. Oh, yes. Wait, no, that was because I don't have that one. Never mind. <laughs> I specifically said that I don't, have, said the, you don't uh, have the relic. The, the tap handle. Mm. Yeah. Uh, also, it is oh. marked now. It is marked now. Okay. Thank you for highlighting that. Brayden, what would you like to do? Uh, All right. All right, I think we're doing pretty good here. Uh, and uh, let's uh, let's do a righteous brand cleric attack. Mm-hmm. Your arse has caught the eye of Wenta, and Rikashi is her hand. That's another just a strength attack, weapon attack. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Uh, I, I'm I'm working on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that is 22. That's a hit. And, uh, uh, and a level one stunt as well. And uh, another uh, 15 damage. The creature gives another squealing cry. Uh, oh, and then a uh, uh, minor action. Mm-hmm. Balmo tilts his, uh, tilts his mug in uh, Rikashi's direction again. May we get what we want, but never what we deserve. See, that makes sense. 
So you get a plus two to your next attack roll or skill or ability check. Uh, the carrion crawler moves to bite Rikashi. Rikashi's armor class is... 20. And just sinks its mandibles into Rikashi. Oh, actually, do I have uh, advantage because it's flanked? 22. Ha, ah, okay. Just barely misses sinking its, fl- its mandibles into Rikashi. So it's your turn, Rikashi. Well, since I've got mandibles, uh, I'm going to just return the favor and shove a sword directly into its maw. Mm-hmm. It's awful, terrifying maw. All right. You can get a level one stunt for that. Oh, hey, same roll. 28. Mm-hmm. It's a hit. Uh, so that is 30. Uh, Very good. Plus that is enough damage. to kill it outright. Okay. So mm-hmm. she pushes her sword into its mouth and pushes and pushes and pushes and eventually hits brain and it stops flailing and squealing and just drops cold still held up by the point of her blade there is carrion crawler blood everywhere yeah um gross thank you for killing it uh no problem and she slides it to the ground sits down (sighs) yeah i guess no problem i guess we did it you sure did, comes the voice from behind you. Uh, yeah, I'm on my feet with mm-hmm. a blade up. M- mug and tap handle up. Behind the two of you, uh, Darbin Tolrick is standing there. He has an arrow knocked in his bow, but um, seems at ease now that he sees that the monster has been killed. So am I not needed then? Mother Warden called me saying that there was a pest that needed fumigating but it looks like you've taken care of it um she looks at him for a second looks down at it you're not gonna are you gonna do you know how to cook this well jump cut to a big banner over the bar at the western wind (laughs) that says special one day only freshwater seafood buffet (laughs) and there's tentacles and there are things that look kind of like crab legs and uh yes in fact there's some lager (laughs) uh and darvin is talking with guests and encouraging them to try this try that making a big show of what an impressive uh display it is oh the egg uh, you know, the the row is very fine and you know, encourages a customer to try some on a toast point. Um, yes, prepared all of all of the carrion crawler plus all of its eggs <laughs> and drew in a lot of customers for the Western wind in the process. Uh, Balmo uh, at, at some point talks a little quietly to Mother Wharton. He a, looks a little perturbed. He's like, I know that uh, I know that Darbin's our friend. I just really wish you had relied on me for this, Brother Balmo. You must understand that sometimes we do for our friends, not because we 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 ask our friends for help, not because we really need their help, but because they need to be needed. And as she's saying this. She looks over slightly meaningfully to where Darbin and Rikashi are chatting near the tentacle buffet. Rikashi is loudly sucking on a crab leg-ish thing. I think that's a good place to end the scene, and I also think that's a good place to end for tonight because we have six scenes in total we want to get through, and... Well, we could probably do another one or even two. I don't think we can do all six tonight, so it's probably good to cut them at the halfway point. That makes sense. Okay, mm-hmm. good. How's this going for people? Is this working out? Yeah, it's going out. That's it this week for the Chimera. 
Our theme music is Hoof, Heart, and Hiss by Matt Weber. You can find a link to more of Matt's work and any other music used in this episode in the show notes. You can also find us online at thechimera.space or on Twitter and Facebook at ChimeraPod. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or just telling your friends. Join us back here in two weeks for the next episode, and thanks for listening. to work in my uh pawning off discussing as soon as as soon as you said like pawning off something awful mm-hmm. as good food i was like gotta be carrying crawler <laughs> so i was gonna put a carrying crawler in if you had it, basically. <laughs> i was i was already thinking that and when you did i was like oh well, then that's easy <laughs> i don't even have to put it in myself nice